Hi everyone, hello and welcome. So, I'm responding to a question I've got about how to find Nash equilibria in matrix games. Remember, if we have a game in normal form, we can represent it using a matrix. We didn't have to, but we could, depending on uh, the particular circumstances. Like if we have two players, we have a finite set of strategies, and we can often represent the game in matrix form. So you see a lot of matrix games in, uh, in economics courses. So how do we find the Nash equilibria in these things? Well, first off, um, as we're starting off with a game, we have players. We have strategies or actions, and we have payoffs. And then to find, a strat to find a Nash equilibrium, we are looking for a strategy profile, which is a list that reports the strategy actually selected by each player. Um, this is going to be a Nash equilibria if no one has a profitable unilateral deviation. So my definition of Nash equilibria, a strategy profile is a Nash equilibria if no one wants to change their strategy, conditional on the other player doing the same, uh, remaining where they are. Okay, so here's an example of a game. I have my row player, cleverly named to select the rows of up or down. So the two strategies for row player are up and down. And column player, cleverly named to select left or right. Strategies are left and right for column player. Then we got these payoffs. And the way that we re represent the payoffs or report the, the payoffs is the first number is the payoff to the row player. The second number is the payoff to the column player. And so if row player selects up and column player selects left, row will get a payoff of three, column gets a payoff of two. By contrast, if row chooses up but column player chooses right, now row gets negative two and column gets six. Okay, so how do we think about solving this game? Finding a Nash equilibria is one solution concept we could look for. So how would we find Nash equilibria? Well, what we can do is we can say, let's take the perspective of row player and say, how is row going to want to respond to a hypothetical choice of column? So I say, if column player selects left, column player has selected the left column, what's row's best response? What's the best row can do? Well, the best response for row is to select down because five is bigger than three. So I'll underline five. Now, what if hypothetically instead, column player chooses right? Well, if column player has chosen right, row's best response is down because one is bigger than minus two. If column selects right, row's best response is down. One is bigger than minus two, so I'll underline one. And notice, it actually didn't matter what column player did. Row always wants to choose down. Row actually has a dominant strategy. Not all games have dominant strategies, but this one does. Dominant strategy has nothing to do with the other player. You have a dominant strategy if one of your strategies is the best relative to your other strategies, no matter what the other person does. That's the case here. Row player actually doesn't care what column player does. Row is always going to choose down. Okay, now let's adopt the perspective of column and see how column should respond conditional on row's choice. So if row selects up, column's best response is actually to choose right. right? If a row has selected up, 6 is bigger than 2, so column's best response to up is right. So I'll underline 6, indicating that that's what column wants to choose. Uh, the strategy, the payoff of 6 results, uh, conditional on those mutual choices. If row selects down, what does column want to do? Well, row still, or column still wants to choose right, right? Because 2 is bigger than minus 1. If, if row selects down, column's best response is right, and so I'll underline 2. And we see actually column has a dominant strategy here too, because it doesn't matter what row does, column always wants to choose right. And like I said, actually, um, not all games have dominant strategies. Most probably don't. And you can have games where both players have a dominant strategy, as this one. You might recognize this as a prisoner's dilemma. Uh, you, can have a, you can have a game where one player has a dominant strategy, and you can have games where no one has a dominant strategy. Okay, so what's our Nash equilibrium? Well, to find a Nash equilibrium, we look for a cell that's got two underlines. Because the way that we are deriving these underlines is we are saying, what was the player's best response? And remember, the definition of the Nash equilibrium is no one wants to switch. So down right is a Nash equilibrium. The strategy profile of down right is a Nash equilibrium. Because while column player is choosing right, row player doesn't want to do anything other than down. And while row player is doing down, column player doesn't want to do anything other than right. So indeed, because these two underlines in the cell mean each is best responding, no one will switch unilaterally. This is a Nash equilibrium. Actually, this is also a prisoner's dilemma. This whole game is a prisoner's dilemma because both players have a dominant strategy. And when they play their dominant strategy, the payoffs are smaller 
than the socially efficient outcome that arrives when they both play their, uh, when they mutually play dominated strategies. Of course, no, we're not going to end up in up left because of the temptation to choose your dominant strategy. So up left, though this generates a payoff of five, which is the largest group surplus, right? This is four, this is four, this is three. Um, up left can't be supported in a one-shot game in equilibrium. Now, if you played this many times, the repeated prisoner's dilemma, yeah, you could get players to coordinate through reputation and reinforcement on up left, but not in a single one-shot game. Okay, and then I said, not all games have dominant strategies, and some games have multiple Nash equilibria. So consider this game. Suppose the payoffs are 3-2 when they select up left, 2-3 when they select down right, and then 1-1 when they select uh, down left or up right. And maybe you can pause the video and think about using the underlying method to find the Nash equilibria. And it's real slick, right? So the Nash equilibria here are up left and down right. Why? Because when column selects left, row player definitely wants up because three is bigger than one. When column player selects right, row player wants down because two is bigger than one. When row player selects up, column player wants left because two is bigger than one. And when row player selects down, column player wants right because three is bigger than one. So we have two Nash equilibria. Nobody has a dominant strategy here because there's not one single strategy that each player prefers irrespective of its opponent's strategy. Also, these indeed are Nash equilibria because once we're here, once we're in up left, nobody wants to switch. If we are at up left and row player switches to down, well, because column player's chosen left, that's going to be a reduction in payoff to one. If column player is choosing left and row player deviates to down, we're at 1 1. Or what if we're at up left and column player deviates to right, we're at 1 1. And you can do the same logic to verify that down right is also a Nash equilibrium.